All right, and then Dan, I'm ready when you are. Good morning, and welcome to another edition of United Way for Southeastern Michigan's What's the Word Wednesday. My name is Courtney Howe, and today we will be joined by Rana Abbas-Taylor, Director of Communications and Marketing at Access, to discuss their work to uplift the contributions and history of the Arab American community and bridge racial and ethnic divides within our community. Just a reminder that the last 10 minutes of today's conversation are reserved for questions. So please leave your questions in the Q&A box if you're watching on Zoom or in the comment box on Facebook. Now, I would like to welcome United Way's president and CEO, Dr. Darian Hudson, to say a few words. Dr. Hudson. Thank you, Courtney. And good morning, everyone. And welcome to What's the Word Wednesday. Today, as we continue to celebrate Arab American Heritage Month, we are going to be sharing with you the important work of one of our greatest partners in the region, ACCESS, which is the Arab Community Center for Economic and Social Services. ACCESS has been serving our community for 50 years and was initially founded to assist Arab immigrants in the adjustment to their new lives in the United States. Over the years, their work has grown to include 10 locations and more than 120 programs and services provided to the community to address social, economic, health, and educational issues. ACCESS has grown to be a leader in helping families in our community in need and empowering them to succeed. Much of this was evidenced at the height of the pandemic and they are still providing these services today. They also work to address anti-Arab and anti-immigrant sentiments and grow understanding of the many contributions of Arab Americans to our society. One of the impactful ways they do this is through the Arab American National Museum, which is a national institution of access. It is the first and only museum dedicated to telling the story of Arab Americans, and we are fortunate that we have it right here in Dearborn. Before our guest speaker joins us today, we'd like to share a quick video about the museum. Among the 35,000 museums across the United States, there is only one museum that tells our story and only one museum that elevates the Arab American voice and inspires the generations of today and the generations to follow. 
a thoughtful narrator of history, a passionate advocate of justice, and an innovative expression of our identity, the Arab American National Museum has served as the heart of Arab American storytelling, making its mark in the world of art, science, and culture. Brought to life by Access in 2005, the creation of this crown jewel and Smithsonian affiliate was guided by Access's vision of a just and equitable society that includes the full story and contributions of Arab Americans. Emerging as a powerful reclamation of our narrative in a space that has been dominated by ignorance and misconceptions that have threatened our cultures, traditions, and truths, the Arab American National Museum preserves our story and shares our contributions with the world. Locally and across our nation, we offer a history created by you to sustain a future that will be built by you. Since the very beginning of time, storytelling has been a way for us to navigate and discover our world. It is what heals us, unites us, and inspires us. Whether it is stories, songs, paintings, photographs, films, textbooks, novels, or poetry, the beauty and contributions of our unique and remarkable community are captured through the history and art that live on in our treasured Arab American National Museum. Thank you uh, for sharing that. It was really an inspiring uh, moment. And it's just sometimes you have to just stop uh, and appreciate all the beauty that we have around us and the importance of humanity. Uh, so thank you uh, for allowing us to share that uh, today. Uh, it really is a gem that's available to everyone uh, in our community. And if you haven't been there, please, please consider making the trip uh, to Dearborn and, and experience the museum. So now we are happy to have Access as Director of Communications and Marketing, Rana Abbas Taylor, join us to discuss what Access is doing and how you can get involved. Rana has been with Access since 2013 and has over 20 years of community service and communications experience, specifically focused on social justice and women's rights. She served previously as the Deputy Director of the American. Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee's Michigan office for eight years. It was appointed to the State of Michigan's Women's Commission from 2006 to 2011. Prior to this, she was on the New Detroit's Immigration Task Force, Advocates for Police and Community Trust, the Michigan Alliance Against Hate Crimes, and the Center for Arab American Studies, among others. Please join me in welcoming Rana to chat with us today. It is no mistake that you are here with us on this day, and we are so eager to hear from you and learn about all the things that Access is doing and all of your contributions to our state. Thank you, Rana. Thank you so much, Dr. Hudson, um, for that great introduction um, and introduction of our Arab American National Museum, and many thanks to the United Way for hosting us um, for this town hall in particular during Arab American Heritage Month. We are so pleased to be here. Um, before I begin, um, I would just like to acknowledge, I feel it is most fitting um, that, uh, especially with regard to this discussion on equity, um, to acknowledge what a difficult month um, it has been for communities of color, in particular the Black community um, here, um, especially with the verdict in the Chauvin trial um, last night. Uh, so I know that there um, really has been a lot that communities of color, and I really want to focus on the Black community, has carried for years and years and years, but in particular this past year during an unprecedented pandemic. Um, during um, really a movement that has gained um, momentum in this past year in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, when we talk about equity and what that means um, for communities of color in the workplace, 
um, and in the world, um, there are a number of things that we ought to consider. Um, when we just think of 2020 and how trying it has been, and you add in um, police brutality against the Black community, um, overwhelming doesn't really even begin um, to describe it. Um, 1,127 people died at the hands of police in 2020 during a year of a worldwide pandemic. And we have heard since yesterday, um, yes, this huge sigh of relief and what resonates with me um, was hearing that George Floyd's brother's reaction to the verdict was relief and release. Um, and there is that, but there's always, there's also the sense for many communities that there's still so much work that needs to be done. And justice isn't justice until it's accessible to all. Um, and so I wanna recognize that and I wanna recognize how heavy this is, this moment in time is um, for people of color, um, in particular black people and what they have to carry with them day in and day out um, as they go on with their lives, as they do their work and how critical it is as we, be as we talk about equity, um, especially in the workplace to recognize and honor that and provide the right support systems for our staff um, as we go through um, really um, evolutionary times, I hope, I keep my fingers crossed as I say that because I do hope um, that is what we are experiencing. Um, so yes, this discussion today um, is more timely than ever. And um, I am honored to be here on behalf of ACCESS, um, especially in recognition of the relationship we have with the United Way, which has been um, exceptionally critical this past year um, in the work that we have done um, to really cater to and provide for the communities that we serve that often are the communities that are most overlooked. Um, and through that partnership this past year, we have really been able to step up those efforts and give back and provide services and provide care, provide testing, provide vaccinations to underserved communities um, throughout uh, Southeast Michigan. Just a little bit about access. Dr. Hudson touched on um, our history a bit. And yes, we are in our 50th year. We are proud to be celebrating our 50th anniversary um, this year. And the organization's evolution uh, in the past 50 years, as Dr. Hudson shared, we um, started out um, out of a small storefront in the south end of Dearborn, bordering southwest Detroit. Um, catering to the very basic needs of a growing community in 1971 and are today quite sizable. Uh, we are a multi-layered organization very much like the United Way in that our services and our programs span a number of areas, whether that is community health, workforce development, education, the arts, social justice, philanthropy. It's quite, di it's quite diverse and many folks um, find it difficult to make the connection. And it's really, I always utilize our vision as that connector to the work that we do. Um, essentially everything that we do within our organization is guided by our vision for a just and equitable society and anchored in our mission of empowerment. We believe at Access that if we truly want to make the world a better place and by make the world a better place, you know, it is that just an equitable world that we all seek. We have to start at the very basic levels. And that is providing sustenance, uplifting and empowering individuals. Uh, I, I use often the metaphor of, you know, a single mom whose primary goal is to make sure she has food on the table for her children and a roof over her head, isn't gonna have as her priority uh, the need to make our world a better place. She needs to be secure. Her family needs to be secure before she is able 
to make an impact on a larger level. And that is really the mindset that we operate under to empower individuals and understanding that by empowering individuals, we are empowering communities. And by empowering communities, we are empowering social change. And that is the formula that we have used um, for years and years, um, one that we are very proud of. Um, and it has also fed into much of the equity work that we have doing, that we have been doing. Um, we have our Campaign to Take on Hate, which is a campaign that we are very proud of that we launched in 2014 to address anti-Arab and anti-Muslim bias, but also to help work um, on our allyship with other communities of color that we understand um, have um, parallel concerns and issues that impact us across the board. Um, in society. And we have been doing this work. Um, essentially, we've seen ourselves as an advocate since our inception. Um, we are constantly advocating for communities that are the most vulnerable in society and providing them with whatever needs they may have. What we began doing in terms of equity, which we hear this word um, so much more now, um, than we did in years past. Um, it doesn't mean that it's something that matters now and never mattered before. It's always mattered. Um, what we wanna make sure is that equity doesn't become a fad um, for any organization, any nonprofit, any corporation that is invested in doing this work. Um, for us, we hope that what this is, this moment in time is, is really an awakening for many individuals, many companies, many organizations um, to do better, to be better, to show up for their staff and their clients and the people that they serve um, in, a, in, a, in a better way. And we are continuing not only to do this work through our programs, but now are investing um, in our own staff as well. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about that because I think that, you know, especially for service organizations, you, there's a huge focus on the work that is provided um, to the communities that they serve. And oftentimes we neglect um, unintentionally those providing that service. And oftentimes when you're working with communities of color, it is people of color who are also providing those services. And as an organization, Access realized, I wanna say about five years ago, how critical it was to be able to provide the same type of support um, and nurturing to our staff that we provide to our clients and the communities that we serve. And um, so five years ago, we began looking at different organizations that do diversity, equity, and inclusion work um, within organizations like Access that have unique needs. And what I mean by unique needs is that we are an organization that caters to immigrant communities. Um, and so oftentimes, and I think for many, um, folks coming from uh, communities of color understand that there is internalized racism within those communities as well. And so there's addressing those issues. There um, is trauma within those communities and addressing those in, in a unique way as well. There's anti-Blackness um, in a lot of those communities. And it really um, stemmed from a place of we need to recognize and reconcile these issues if we are going to do this work in an authentic way. And so that is when we began looking at um, different organizations that could provide us with the guidance that we needed as an agency to do this work right and to do it responsibly. And about, uh, I want to say, Two and a half years ago, we partnered with we partnered with the Center for Equity and Inclusion um, to have them come in and take a look at our systems and our processes and the work that we are doing internally and help us do better. Um, and we have now, for the past two and a half years, been working closely with them. So I say all of this. Um, to really bring to light um, how multi-layered equity work 
is and can be and needs to be. Um, it is not superficial. There is nothing superficial about this work. And if we are gonna be genuine and if we are gonna be responsible, we need to be looking at how we are, address, are addressing it at various touch points within our organization. Um, I do want to bring it back to um, Arab American Heritage Month as well, because that is why we are here today. And I'm trying to keep time. I think we have 10 more minutes. So I definitely want to leave some room for Q&A for anyone. But we are excited to be celebrating Arab American Heritage Month. Um, this is not um, a federally recognized month. It is recognized in some states, including the state of Michigan. And um, we are excited to to be able to have a month where we uplift the contributions of Arab Americans to society here. And yes, our museum is a great touch point for folks who would like to um, know a little more about who Arab Americans are, how long they've been here, what their contributions have been. Uh, the video that was shared earlier gives um, some perspective on that. Our museum, although currently closed um, because of the pandemic, offers a number of virtual programming options um, and public education options. And I do believe that a link will be shared for anyone who is interested in learning more about some of the events that we have this month in honor of Arab American Heritage Month and in the coming months, um, just in terms of public programming and providing um, something for the public as we continue to navigate this pandemic that has had a shift how we do life <laughs> this past year. Um, so I'm excited to be here and I would love to hear from anyone if there are questions. Ronald, thank you so much for sharing that. I know we do have a, quite a few questions um, regarding some of the programs and events that you all have. But one question that we have from Facebook, I'm gonna read verbatim. We need to hold more discussions between business owners within the Detroit and the neighbors who are around them to move neighborhoods out of food trauma. Can you share any work Access is doing within local business communities? Yes, um, actually our campaign to take on hate um, has recognized um, this issue in particular um, in Detroit, um, in particular between the black community and the Arab American community. We know this is a problem. We know that the establishment in Minneapolis outside of where George Floyd was killed was Arab owned and operated. We recognize that there is work to be done within these communities and these relationships. And we have actually, um, I encourage folks to follow our campaign to take on hate. We have begun through this campaign to address anti-Blackness in the Arab community, which is real. And a lot of um, folks don't um, realize that the Arab American community is actually a very racially diverse community. We have Black Arabs in our community, depending on their lineage um, and where their family and generations come from. Yes, we have Black Arabs and we recognize that there is colorism even within our own community and through our anti-bias campaign, that is a, a priority issue that we are addressing because what is quite clear is when we look at systemic racism, we cannot even begin, all of it is tied to what we see today um, impacting different communities. And if we don't address it at its source and at its core, we're not doing the work in, a, in the right way. I absolutely agree. And I really appreciate you for uplifting uh, that, you know, that is a prevalent issue within our direct community. So we thank you for that. Another question we have, can you share information regarding access to COVID efforts, particularly testing and vaccine distribution? Yes, we have actually um, really stepped out as um, a leading organization in getting resources 
testing, vaccinations to the most vulnerable communities in our state. Access was one of the first organizations to begin COVID testing last March. Um, and we were the first organization to offer mobile COVID testing um, back in, I wanna say April and May of last year. We were traveling to different parts of the state to different communities that didn't have access to test facilities, making sure we were providing testing, partnering with other community organizations to do that. To date, we have, I believe, I wanna say somewhere between 13 and 14,000 vaccinations have been given just in the past month since we have been a designated vaccine site. Um, we had, in fact, just this past Friday, a Ramadan uh, event, vaccination event that took place uh, in the evening. I believe it was from 8 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, to cater to the Muslim community that is observing. And the reason we chose to do this event, um, as anyone who has received a vaccine knows, you know, you want to wait about 15 minutes after you receive the vaccine, drink lots of water, make sure you're hydrated. And it's hard to do that if you're fasting. So we wanted to make sure we provided that accommodation, in particular to a community like many other uh, community, vulnerable communities that has been very hesitant to get the vaccine um, and not trusting of systems in place that have done that. So we are very proud of the work that we have been able to do to serve as that conduit for the communities that we serve um, and, and be that trusted um, intermediary for them. Wonderful. Rhonda, I, we really appreciate that. And, you know, I am one that uh, utilizes you all's uh, services for access for the vaccine. So I really appreciate you as well. My second dose is Friday, so I will see you there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so um, I did want to, again, thank you for all of your, your services that you provide to our community. Just a reminder for those who are watching, we do have testing um, information that is going to be in the chat box there, information regarding the events around Arab American History Month and the museum is also in the chat box. And if you're looking for information on Take On Hate and how you can get involved, please visit their Facebook pages there. And at, as of this moment, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hudson to say a few closing words. Rana, thank you so much. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Rana, for being here with us today uh, and for sharing your heartfelt, uh, heartfelt message uh, to the community. Uh, it's really needed at this time, and I appreciate you taking the time to see us. It matters. Uh, wanted to also share that we fund Take on Hate. We are proud partners uh, in this work with Access. And so um, continue um, to, to just stay close to the work that we're doing together. Um, as we've been saying throughout this entire broadcast, this work is far from over. Uh, it's going to take all of us um, to lock arms together and make the choice uh, to change and to promote equity and to create a better community. So with that being said, uh, we are launching our first 21 day equity challenge from May 21st, so a month from today through June 18th. Uh, it's no accident that this is the day before Juneteenth, um, and we are also approaching the 100th commemoration of the um, riots in Tulsa uh, on June 21st. And so stay tuned uh, for quite a bit more information and events uh, related to our equity challenge. Um, if you participate, you will receive an email every weekday filled with videos, articles, and infographics to broaden your collective understanding of the history and current issues surrounding racial inequity and what all of us can do to move our community forward. In addition, there will be opportunities to engage with fellow participants and share what we've learned in virtual events throughout the month. We're calling them roundtables, and we hope that you'll sign up. We are excited to have so many of our community partners join us on this journey, including our guests from Access today and their CEO, Hassan Jabber, who is also a United Way board member. You can sign up today at www.unitedwaysem.org slash equity challenge. And that information is also in the chat for you. We also wanted to highlight that this week is National Volunteer Week and United Way for Southeastern Michigan is proud to partner with organizations across Wayne, Oakland and Macomb counties to offer a wide variety of virtual and in-person volunteer opportunities that drive meaningful impact in our community. 
To learn more and to sign up, please visit unitedwayscm.org slash NVW2021. And we know it's snowing outside, but there are plenty of virtual opportunities for you to engage in as well. So no excuses. Let's get out there and help our community. Also wanted to highlight two on one. If you are listening to this broadcast and need help, or you know someone who needs help, help is available 24 seven. All you have to do is call 211 or you can go to our website and visit, um, excuse me, visit unitedwayscm.org slash 211. And yes, you can call 211 to get assistance with vaccinations and scheduling, or you can go to michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine to get the same level of assistance. Uh, we are here to provide support for utilities, uh, for housing, transportation, uh, finding food pantries, anything that you need, you can start with this number and we'll connect you to over 1300 social service agencies in our community. Last but not least, wanted to share that our next town hall, uh, the What's the Word Wednesday, is going to be on workplace safety during COVID-19. Uh, we are pleased to have Sean Egan, who was the director of COVID-19 workplace safety at the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. And that'll be next Wednesday at 10 a.m. You can also get alerts for our different town halls at unitedwayscm.org slash virtual town halls. So I know that was a mouthful, but I hope that you all really took away um, some key ideas and actions from today's conversation. Rana, we are so thankful that you took the time to be here with us today. Uh, this work is far from over, but so thankful that we have partners like Access who are fighting with us and standing with us uh, during this time. So with that, I wish all of you well, enjoy the rest of your week and continue to stand united.